So new propulsion technology introduces new problems. We see, you know, in the news all the time, NASA's X-57 that's got 14 motors on the wings. Uh, here's some other examples that just have a really a lot of different propulsors. So we have many motors that we're now focused on. You know, lots, lots of different motors all in one structure. Um, and, and this is pretty unique compared to previous aircraft types. We also are now interacting with high voltages. Um, so that adds a safety element. And we now have cabling and, and considerations from the voltage point of view. These systems are inverter driven and, and inverters might be a new novel thing for, for aircraft largely. But these are really taking a, a battery, turning into a high frequency electrical signal, um, which again is gonna introduce new challenges. These inverters are not just unique to aircraft, because of redundancy, they have higher phase counts and higher complexity. Um, so they're really novel to the industry as well. Aircraft, everything's about lightweight. These motors are very lightweight. Um, often we achieve that by having a low inductance. And this low inductance gives them some unique challenges like current ripple. And this current ripple can, again, give us things like torque ripple, where we really have to consider this electrical signal is getting turned into a mechanical entity. And this torque ripple, which is a, a torsional vibration, is being caused by motor construction, as well as the excitation currents. So by light weighting the motors, having that low inductance gives us a current ripple, which results in torsional vibrations. And you might say, what's the big deal? These torsional vibrations can do things like cause bending moments in propellers. Uh, and, and it's really an interesting you know, cause and effect. Because we need a lightweight, we might have torsionals. And when we can start considering that we have many, many different propulsors on a wing, having these torsional vibrations add up or, or overlap can be really challenging. So new propulsion technology has given us a lot of new challenges. Now with new challenges, we always need new testing. So how do we test these propulsion methods? Well, in the picture on the right-hand side, this is a picture from, from ES Aero on behalf of NASA, um, which is a dynamometer test stand for an electric motor. So we have a device under test here, we have a load machine somewhere over here, and the drive line in the middle. And what are we measuring? Well, these aircraft need to be airborne for a period of time. So we're making efficiency measurements on the motors and inverters. We want these aircraft to be able to fly for as long as possible reliably. These motors and inverters, they're going to have a, a lot of different conditions they have to deal with, different air conditions, different temperature conditions, and, and different failure states. So we really want to understand how that motor and inverter talk to each other and how to control them so we can go through all of these different transitions, takeoff, landing, you know, hitting a bird, unfortunately. We're going to want to characterize that torque and speed. We're going to want to understand where things like torque ripple happen and where we get those torsional vibrations at which speeds so we can avoid them or mitigate that risk. And then naturally we need to understand all of our failure mold, modes, both electrical and mechanical. We need to look at the, the reliability and durability of these motors. So we need to do endurance testing. Um, and sometimes we'll, we'll run tests for months or weeks and, and look at how they uh, break down over time. Because we have many motors, um, we need to do an electrical system evaluation. If we have seven motors or 14 motors sharing a common electrical bus, we need to make sure that electrically those interactions don't bring down the system. If we have one motor go bad, do we harm the other motors? So the DC bus interactions can be extremely interesting and really give us um, a lot of understanding of the stability of our system. And lastly, um, you know, we're, we're looking at vibration and noise and vibration. And many of these electric aircraft tests, while they're characterizing the um, motor measurements, you know, the efficiency, the electrical measurements, they're also going to look at the vibration uh, because this is going to tell us things about the resonance and, and maybe how that's affecting the structure. So lastly, how, how can we expedite this electrical testing? Well, we've got a battery, a motor, an inverter and a gearbox. And, and sometimes in the aircraft, we do not have a gearbox. But we need to characterize efficiency. 
Um, we need to characterize sound and vibration. We need to characterize controls, torque ripples. How can we expedite this? Well, if we have one measurement system where we can timeline all the data, the electrical and mechanical data, we can understand how that high frequency inverter causes high frequency torques, causes uh, torsional vibrations. And, and then we can look at electrical to torque and speed. So we, we can understand that. Um, having all of these measurements time aligned also lets us understand both the frequency domain and implications in the time domain. So we get that cause and effect. Having all these measurements in one common place is going to allow us to do a variety of tests with one test rig and potentially even one test. So we can do efficiency testing, sound and vibration testing, control and calibration torque ripple with one test run. We can ramp up the motor, ramp down the motor, understand all of these different characteristics. We're gonna save ourselves time, but also uh, accelerate our time to market. And lastly, if we have all of these tests in one location, this data can be used by many groups. If the structures group wants torque ripple data, you can have those accelerometers as well as those torque ripples all in one location. So your electrical simulation and your structures groups can all use this data. And you can start to run tests where maybe you take voltage, current, and torque ripple, and then run a frequency domain analysis where you can look at the bands on your voltage, your current, and then how those translate to acceleration or noise. And this is really important because when we start getting those accelerations, we understand how the currents cause the accelerations or vibrations. Then we can take that data, that torque data, that acceleration data, and pass it over to somebody like Doug. And, and now I'm going to transition over to Doug and he's gonna tell us all about structures. Thanks, Mitch. 